James, obviously the Epistle of Hebrews, and also the Epistle of Jude were all written to Jews. You can't properly understand what they mean for us, for all of us, Jew and Gentile, unless you understand who they were written to in their historical setting. Sitzimleben, if you like the term. Okay? One thing we see is that Peter, warning Jewish believers in his epistle, spoke about Satan going around, knowing his time is short, and looking to devour. Satan sees the natural branches being grafted in again. He knows that that is a sign of his doom. He knows that Jesus said the Jews would have to be regathered to Israel and to Jerusalem for Christ to return. There's a lot more to what you see with the anti-Israel bias and bigotry, the so-called disinvestment movement, boycott and disinvestment movement, and the hypocrisy of the UN. After Tiananmen Square, thousands of people massacred, they won't say a word. <laughs> Israel has the best human rights record in the Middle East, the best Christian rights record in the Middle East, and the best women's rights record in the Middle East. Yet they're the ones everybody picks on. <laughs> the utter hypocrisy of it. But we as believers are to know that this is Satan trying to destroy Israel, and particularly trying to displace them from Jerusalem in order to preempt the return of Yeshua, of Jesus. But he sees when the natural branches are being grafted in again. It's a sign of his approaching demise. He's getting more frantic. He knows his time is short, Peter, writing to Jewish believers, says. Not a pleasant subject, but a necessary one. I'd like to talk tonight about the ten weapons of Satan. The ten weapons Satan is using against the body of Yeshua in Israel and against Jewish and Arab believers in Israel. The ten weapons Satan is using against the body of Messiah in Israel, and against Israeli believers, the ten major weapons of Satan. He's trying to stop the spread of the gospel. He's trying to stop the proliferation of the message of salvation among the Jews. He sees the growth that God is bringing about. Now, I had the privilege of knowing, before they went on to be with the Lord, some of the pioneers of the body of Messiah in Israel. Going back to the British Mandate, I knew a few of them, and I knew a number of people who knew them. That verse comes to mind, cast much bread upon the water. We will reap in a due season. For years, a small handful of believers, some Jews, mostly non-Jews, did nothing but pass out New Testaments in Hebrew and Yiddish and so forth for years, many years, many. They did it by faith. There were Christians praying for them, but there was only a handful of them. They couldn't have imagined even 100 believing Jews in Israel much less tens of thousands. Couldn't have imagined it. Cast much bread upon the water. Satan has seen this growth. He knows it spells his doom. He knows these things are signs of the end. The rebirth of Israel and the rebirth of, and I use the term sparingly, Jewish Christianity in Israel. Now, again, there are terms we can use but you wouldn't say it in Israel. For instance, you would never use the term missionary in Israel. It's a bad word. It puts an obstacle to the gospel. You don't say missionary. You can call him an evangelist or something like that, but you never, never missionary. It may as well be a swear word. <laughs> 
Well, the term Christianity, the same. Church, the same. These terms have different connotations in Israel than they do here in Britain. The first thing Satan is using, the first thing Satan is using to attack the proliferation of the gospel in Israel Churchianity. I don't like to call it Christianity. I'd rather call it Christendom or Churchianity. Nominal Christianity. Non evangelical Christianity. True story. I knew a charismatic Catholic monk, nice guy named Gregory, attended Bible studies with us. Nice guy. And he was a born-again Catholic, as he professed it, but he was a Carmelite monk and he stayed in the monastery. He'd be with us on Friday night singing Hallelujah, Baruch Haba, B'Shem Adonai. But every year in Haifa they have this ridiculous procession where they move a big statue of Mary, the mother of Jesus, medium, from her summer home to her winter home. She doesn't like the cold weather, you see. <laughs> and they're bowing down to it and throwing flowers in front of it and carrying candles and all this and singing Ave Maria. And there is our brother, Gregory, the born-again Catholic monk, dressed up in his monastic frock, carrying a candle, singing Ave Maria, gee, it's good to see you. <laughs> True story. Now, I like this guy personally, you understand. I didn't dislike him. When Jews and Muslims, when Jews see that, you shall not make a graven image Anything on heaven above or earth beneath, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. The Hebrew word for worship, hishtakvaya, from the infinitive, the hishtahavot, has the connotation of bowing down. Greek the same, proskuto, but we're talking Hebrew here. We can talk about religious art, Michelangelo or something innocuous like that, or the biblical theme paintings of Rembrandt. But when you use these things as religious icons and bow down to them reverentially, these are the sins of idolatry and necromancy, praying to the dead. Now, don't misunderstand me. Hasidic Judaism is just as crazy. Kabbalistic Judaism is just as crazy as anybody or anything. But we're talking here about the damage done to the cause of the gospel in Israel by churchianity. The average Israeli, Jew or Arab, Muslim, but we're talking now mainly Jews, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Hem <laughs> Nozrim. They're all Christians. They don't make these distinctions. Some of the more knowledgeable ones may. People in the Israeli diplomatic corps, Israeli ambassadors and people in the higher echelons of political power, understand the necessary of evangelical Christian support for Israel in the United States politically. They understand that. People in the Mitzrat HaTayarut, in the tourism ministry, they understand the importance of evangelical Christians who are pro-Zionist coming to Israel for business reasons, for economic reasons. The Ministry of Tourism might know it. The Foreign Ministry might know it. Politicians might know it. But the average Israeli does not know it. 
the local believers don't identify themselves as notrim from the word Nazareth. You distinguish between a born-again believer and a nominal Christian because the, the regenerate Christians, the born-again believers, refer to themselves as maminim, believers. Humamin, humamin, imamina. They don't call themselves notrim. Notrim <laughs> are the Lutherans, or the Anglicans. But above all, two extremely damaging churches to the cause of Christ. Obviously, the Roman Catholic Church would be one. When Israeli students study the history of the Jews and of Israel, they're taught about the Crusades and what the Crusades did to the Jews in school at Salbanim. This is the Catholic Church. They know about this. Uh, the other, and it's just as damaging. If you don't know, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, I'm sorry, the uh, Greek Orthodox, it is more Meshugana than Roman Catholicism in certain respects. They believe the icons or the window or icons are windows with a metaphysical property. They're the window into the spiritual realm. So they have to pray through the icon. When Jews see these people coming to the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, kneeling down and kissing a stone because by some tradition it's the one Jesus was anointed in. None of this stuff is any older than Constantine's mother, Helen the Great, uh, in the 4th century. None of it, virtually. Uh, when Jews see this idolatry, this superstition, this necromancy, practiced by churches with what they know have a history of anti-Semitism for centuries, this is a major, major tool of Satan in preventing Israeli Jews from considering the claims of their own Messiah. They have turned Yeshua into a goy. Nothing wrong with being a Gentile, providing you want one. Now, again, God foreknew these things. They're prophetically predicted. But in terms of practicality, there is an unnecessary burden, a challenge to Israeli believers to try to explain to other Israelis they're not real believers. <laughs> That's not a true church. That's not what we believe. We're different. <laughs> They don't make a difference. Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, they don't make a difference. They don't care Baptist, Pentecostal. They don't make a difference between believers and unbelievers. But they automatically associate the iconography, the idolatry, the necromancy, praying to the dead, and the superstition of the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, that's Christianity to them. It creates an unnecessary obstacle to the evangelization of Israelis. There, was, there is a new apostolic reformation guy called Lou Engel. It would have been bad enough if he did this in San Diego or something. He had to do it in Jerusalem. And it gets on the internet and in the newspapers, he's standing there in Jerusalem, and there's a representative of the pedophile protecting Pope standing there. He gets down on his knees, crawls across the floor, and kisses the shoes, kisses the feet of the Pope's representative. And he says he's born again, he's no apostolic reference, and he's kissing, the guy's crazy. Now, I'm not suggesting Hasidic Jews are any less nuts. Believe me, they are totally crazy, too. But churchianity 
is a conspicuous instrument of Satan as an obstacle to the proliferation of the gospel in Israel. It creates a big, big obstacle and an unnecessary challenge to Jewish believers in sharing their faith. Churchianity will be the first. Second, Neo knew Ebionism. Neo Ebionism. The ancient Ebionites were Jews who attributed to Yeshua, to Jesus, what was actually true of John the Baptist. The Ebionites said, Yeshua is the Messiah, but not God. They denied his deity. We have a neo ebionism in Israel. There's not a lot of them, but a little leaven leavens the whole lump. They've done their damage. neo ebionism Now you will hear a lot of chatter about quote-unquote secret believers in Israel among the orthodox and ultra-orthodox. Even in Meir Sharim in Jerusalem or B'nai Brach near Tel Aviv, you'll hear the secret believers and the, among the Hasidim, you'll hear that. <coughs> well, I've met some of these. I've seen these people. I've even seen one or two in, in, in London and in Stamp, uh, Golders Green. They're around in New York and they're around in Israel. They exist. I've seen them. <coughs> But when you talk to them, although they may secretly believe in the messiahship of Yeshua, they probably do not believe in his deity. Most of them are not born again. They've just arrived at the conclusion intellectually he's the messiah. Now I'm not saying there are not exceptions. But when you hear about secret believers, you cannot say that they're believers in the sense of being regenerate, of being born again. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How can you be born again and not say so? Certainly in Israel. In Saudi Arabia, maybe I can understand it. neo ebionism is an instrument and weapon of Satan. If he can't convince a Jew, a religious Jew, Jesus is not the Messiah, he will try to persuade them not to believe that he's God, made man. That he's only a unique man, that's all. neo ebionism is the second. Third, <laughs> Neo Galatianism. The most popular form of Neo-Galatianism in the church today are Seventh-day Adventists, trying to live under two covenants. 
The extreme access of the messianic movement, however, has neo-Galatians trying to put people under two covenants. I knew one chap named Moshe Ben Ma'ir in my youth. He was sending his sons to Orthodox yeshivas. Two of his three sons wound up in mental institutions. There was one of these who called himself the Messianic Rabbi of London, who went to Israel. He got involved with the anti-missionary activist Shmuel Golding. It's not gossip, malicious rumor, it's Chuck Snow was his name. But he goes to Israel. You get more and more legalistic. Not just Torah observant, but in a Galatian, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? The Greek word is mesmero. He wound up leaving his wife and his child. He goes to Israel and gets involved with the anti-missionary movement of Shmuel Golding. And these guys are serious. They, they, they would abduct people at one time and take them down to the Negev to a deprogramming center. That, that actually happened. There's another one of these Meshuganas whose wife, his rightful wife, is Israeli. Now he's got seven wives or something. Says he's the Messiah. You know who I mean, Philip Sharp. These guys are nuts. Now what makes them dangerous? There's not a lot of them, but what makes them so dangerous to the cause of Yeshua? The publicity and media exposure they get. BBC, Jewish Chronicle, Jewish Telegraph, he's now with Shmuel Golding. A very dangerous way for Satan to discredit belief in Yeshua has been the Neo-Galatians. You foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Turn with me, please, to the Epistle to the Romans. Chapter 9, verse 4. <coughs> My kinsmen according to the flesh, in other words, other Jews, all rights, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons. Notice belongs is present continuous active in both Greek and English. It's something ongoing. Not belonged, not past tense, present and ongoing. To whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory of the covenants. Not covenant, covenants. The Athiki, both the old and the new. The Abrahamic, the Sinaitic, the Davidic, and the new. Some people have tried to minimize it. Supersessionism is an obstacle to the proliferation of the gospel among Jews generally, and certainly in Israel is no exception. We call it replacementism.
replacement theology has other negative ramifications for both the church and for Israel. It's not just this, but right now we're addressing this. Every Jew knows. Why did everybody always hate us? Why does the world single us out? Why has it always been like this? Jews who are not religious are aware of this. They all know it. And the only answer they've ever had is, because you're the chosen people. God would give his word and send his salvation from the Messiah through Israel. Whether they accept him or not. When you say to a Jew, you're no longer the chosen people, we are. <laughs> If God can break his covenant to Israel, he can break his covenant to anybody. Remember, he never made a covenant with the church. They're grafted in. Non-Jews, I'm sorry, I put that wrongly. Non-Jews are grafted in to the covenantal promises to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Replacement theology. It abounds even among evangelicals outside of the United States. It's in the United States, but not nearly as bad as it is here. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, J.C. Ryle, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Charles Spurgeon, they all believed in a prophetic destiny for Israel and the Jews. When Britain was still a Christian country, you had this consciousness of God having a purpose for Israel prophetically. I can show you the Puritans were writing that in the 17th century. Now it is a minority view. It is symptomatic and emblematic of the decline of biblical Christianity in Britain. You understand? I speak a lot in Asia. Even countries like Indonesia that are predominantly Muslim. Malaysia. When I speak in Malaysia or Indonesia, these are Muslim countries. The believers all want to know about Israel. <laughs> you go to places in Africa where the churches are growing. They want to know about Israel. Latin America, churches are growing. Philippines, churches are growing. They want to know about Israel. The places you see they don't want to know that are replacementist is where Scriptural Christianity is declining. It is a symptom of the decline. But it is also an obstacle to the spread of the gospel. You are no longer the chosen people. We are. We have usurped your position. With absolutely zero scriptural backing for that point of view. There are verses that directly contradict it. Read in context, Romans 11 tells us, believing non-Jews, born again non-Jews, replace unbelieving Jews. That is true. The natural branches are Jewish believers. Unbelieving Jews are spiritually cut off 
from the patriarchal promises and are replaced by non-Jews who do believe. But it's not a different tree. It's not a different root. It's Reza. And if God can make Eskimos and pygmies believe in the Jewish God and the Jewish Messiah, how much easier can he make his own people believe in their own Messiah, Romans tells us. A partial hardening has happened, but they'll be grafted in again. Replacement theology is alien to the teaching of the scriptures, and it is definitely an obstacle to Jewish evangelism and to Jewish evangelism in Israel. It's an obstacle. You see that these Protestant churches in Israel believe it. They believe it. The Luther's, most, apart from ITAC, which is like CMJ, apart from ITAC, the Anglicans believe it. The fifth weapon of Satan. My family is a mixture of the worst two races of people in the world, as you know. Irish, Catholic, and Jewish. If you can't con them, slug them. In Roman Catholic Ireland, as it once was, the Roman Catholic Church is widely discredited because of pedophilia and the conspiracy of the hierarchy of the Roman Church to protect sex criminal priests and nuns at the expense of not protecting their own children. People know this in Ireland. The Roman Catholic Church has lost, forfeited, most of its social influence and most of its political influence. That's why Ireland was the first country to go for same-sex marriage, to legalize abortion, all this stuff. It's because the Roman Church has lost its grip. A vacuum is created. While it is true in Ireland that there has been an increase in the number of young people in the Republic of Ireland becoming Christians. Most of them have turned to godlessness, moral decadence, and new age. A new age spirituality in lieu of Roman Catholicism. Now, of course, there, there's a political dimension to it with the republicanism and so forth versus unionism. Israel is much the same. Our son was in the military, two years in tanks, combat brigade, one year in the legal corps because he was a legal graduate. You're a student. The army needs you. The Milawim, the reserves need you. They can call you up. They don't care about your final exams. It can mess your whole life up. You want to go abroad, you need their consent. But you got these yeshiva bookers, as they're called in Yiddish, in yeshivas, getting paid for going to the yeshivas. They don't have to go to the army. Israel was in a very, very serious economic crisis in the 1980s. Inflation went over a thousand percent. They needed an American bailout to stop the economy from collapsing at one point. They were in big trouble. There were people afraid of all kinds of things, including the 
country heading for some kind of dictatorship. It was a turbulent time economically that was beginning to have serious political and social ramifications. During the darkest hour, when the country was a half step above being broke, the orthodox parties like Agudat Israel were demanding increased subsidies for the yeshivas. They had this rabbi named Shapiro who was an anti-Zionist. He didn't believe there could be a Jewish state till the Messiah came. It's just a state of Jews. Yet, he demanded subsidies for his yeshivas and got them. I've got to go to the army. My son has to go to the army, but these yeshiva boys don't. There is a resentment among secular Israelis of the religious. Now, you do have Hezder Yeshiva, you do have a religious branch of the army, in fairness. But the ultra-Orthodox? In the thinking of secular Israelis, particularly educated ones, Zionism, the Halutzim, the pioneers, their ideology was ancient Israel was an army, was a nation of soldiers and farmers. If a Jew in Europe had a farm, his barn would be burned down and his land confiscated in a pogrom. Jews were forced into shtetls, ghettos, like Fiddler on the Roof, right? We're going to be the Am Ha'aretz. We're going to be the people of the land. We're going to go back. We're not going to be the people of the shtetl anymore. But as I pointed out yesterday, most rabbis, particularly the Orthodox and particularly the Ashkenazi Orthodox, vehemently oppose Zionism. Yet, according to biblical prophecy, the Jewish state was reborn despite their opposition. Not only was it reborn without them, it was reborn in the face of their opposition. Now they want to control it. No, we want to shtetl. You go through Meir Sharim in Jerusalem, or B'nai Brak next to Tel Aviv, they're like the Amish, the Pennsylvania Dutch in America. They have a mind that they live like it was 1690. They are mentally and culturally in a shtetl in Lithuania in the 1700s. And getting paid for it. <laughs> The tax rate in Israel is astronomical. They're getting subsidies. All over. Jews are the third biggest poverty group in New York. Despite the Jewish affluence in America, Jews are the third biggest poverty group because of the Hasidic Jews getting welfare, getting dole. They do the same thing in Israel. Now you have to understand Israelis resent this. I want to be an engineer. I've got a big mouth exam coming up. Tough. The Milouin needs you. <laughs> people don't like this. We don't want to be the people of the shtetl. No, you need a shtetl. Now, understand something. At any time in history, there was always one nation that punched above its weight. We know in pre-Christian Europe it was the Greeks. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, Archimedes, Herodotus, all these guys, Pythagoras, all these guys were Greeks, right? They're all Greeks. Then the Roman Empire. Seneca and Cicero, all these guys are, are, are Romans. All of them. During the Protestant Renaissance, everybody was Dutch. 
How did a little country like Holland do all these? In the age of empire, everybody was English, Scottish, or Irish. Great Britain, it's a small place compared to, but it conquered a quarter of the world. At one time, seven out of eight Muslims lived under the Union Jack. Seven-eighths of the world's Muslims were under British rule at one time. People don't realize these things. During the Renaissance, the Italians had their time. Before the Inquisition, the Spanish. It was all South America, the practice, except for Brazil, which went to the Portuguese, but it was Iberia. There's never been, the, the Ottoman Empire was the Turks. There's never been a time when somebody did not punch above their weight, demonstrably, in every field. When Europe was in the Dark Ages, Islam had its golden age. It was not fundamentalist Islam, it was a westernized Islam. You could write a check in Damascus and cash it in Morocco. That's how advanced their financial system was. The Renaissance came when the Crusades brought the learning from the Muslim world and from what was left of the Byzantine Empire back to Europe. Europe was in the Dark Ages under Roman Catholicism. If you want to know what a Roman Catholic world would look like, look at the Dark Ages. The Arabs had their era, the Dutch had their era, the British had their era, the Romans had their era, the Greeks had their era, the Italians, the Renaissance, they had their era. Everybody had an era. Undoubtedly, in the 20th century, beginning in Germany, then the United States, and now increasingly Israel, the Jews are having their era. A disproportionate amount of Jews at the forefront of a number of fields, particularly the sciences, the media, things like this. Everybody's had their era. But the Jewish era only came into being after the Askalah associated with Mendelssohn, whose grandson was a Jewish believer and a composer. Moses Mendelssohn, the grandson was Felix. The Askala was the Jewish Enlightenment. The rabbis lost their control of Jewish learning. Any Jew who was a free thinker like Spinoza, they castigated him. Only when the rabbis lost their power did you see this high level of, of Jewish achievement? Particularly in, 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 first in Germany, then with Israeli in Britain, and then in the United States, and now increasingly in Israel. See this. Now the Orthodox want that control again. <laughs> The same ones that held the Jews down and held the Jews back, they want the power to do so again. They look upon secular Israelis, the way they look, the, the Hilonim and things like this, they look upon secular Israelis the way they looked upon Goys and the Galut and the Diaspora. <laughs> it's amazing. Israelis resent this. Young people are fed up with it. They know the rabbis are charlatans. They look upon the yeshiva boys as cowards who won't fight in the, in, in the military. You hide on back of Jews better than yourself. I remember the Yom Kippur War 1973. I will never forget this, front page of the New York Times. The White House ordered all American citizens out of Israel. There was a line of Hasidim with peyot down to their knees and black coats from here to Halifax, lined up, queued up at Ben Gurion Airport trying to get out of Israel to go back to Brooklyn. <laughs> Israelis resent this. So they will not look for spiritual meaning among the rabbis unless they were born into it. There are exceptions. The Chabad tries to get Jews to make Teshuvah and become that. But 
Most secular Israeli young people don't like or respect the religious. The same as the young people in Ireland don't respect the Roman church. So they look elsewhere. Where are they going? I'm sorry to say, the new spirituality, Isaiah chapter 2, my people are filled with influences from the East. Israel Hanavi Perek Bet. Fifth weapon of Satan. New age. You see, I, 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 we have a mission. We have Moriel Thailand. We have a ministry to the Buddhists in Thailand. Tons of Israelis, more Israeli young people than any other country, I think, with the backpack in Thailand. The, 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 they go to Buddhism, they go to, to, to yoga. They... <laughs> New Age, Eastern religion, becomes the alternative to Talmudic Judaism. Some of them get saved, praise God. But the body of Christ in Israel is in direct competition, not just with Talmudic Judaism, but with New Age, the alternative to it. Six. The Mitzrad Hapanim or Panimi uh Ekumrim uh interior. Yeah. Yeah, Panim. The Mitzrad Panim. The interior ministry and the ministry of religious affairs. The most un workable form of democracy in the world, if you want to call it democracy, is proportional representation. It's been a disaster anywhere that's had it, like Germany. It's a disaster in Germany. To get your coalition partners, you have to have a Green Party foreign minister to make a, <laughs> a coalition. So you have centrists with the extreme left. You've got to make political deals with minor parties to get a majority. It happens in Germany, but it really happens in Israel. The religious parties, like Shas and the National Religious Party, they negotiate their relatively small number of seats in the Knesset, in the parliament, for a disproportionately large amount of political control and representation in the government. This goes back to Ben Gordian. He made a deal with the National Religious Party. Menachem Begin lured some of them away. That's how the Likud first got power. The religious held the balance of power. They turned the country from labor to Likud, to the Jabotinskyas. It wouldn't have happened without them. Their demands are ridiculous. <coughs> we demand control of the Ministry of Education. I mean, sort of, we got it. We demand control of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. We got it. We demand control of the Mitzrayim Epidemi. We got it. Interior Ministry, we got the religion. And so you have religious bureaucrats determining things like who's the Toshav's money, Ezra Hut citizenship status. I'll give you an example. If you don't know, I've been married three times. I have actually been married three times to the same woman. She's sitting back there. You would not believe the problems they can cause for believers. Believers.
Rufus go to Cyprus and all this stuff. I got married legally in Paraguay. Then we had to have a wedding for unsaved relatives because they wouldn't come to what they saw as a Christian one. And then the, the ones the Yosef showed you the photo of, we didn't consider ourselves married until we did it with the blessings of, of the body of, of Messiah. I was married to the same woman three times over a six-week period. <laughs> I hope I'm not embarrassing my wife, but we weren't sure if consummating the marriage would have been a sin or not, so we didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy to have to get married three times to the same woman. I have literally and actually gotten married three times. Why? That's crazy. Because of them. Believers go to Cyprus and they get lawyers and... Yeah. <laughs> there was a lawyer in Tel Aviv who specialized in it. Remember him? He's special. I made his living doing it. <laughs> ben Menasha, that was his name. Yeah. 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 I know two cases where Jews who believed, who were Jews, unquestionably Jews. It's that Kugler was one and this other guy from, from uh, Zimbabwe. They fought in the courts nine years. Years to get a Teoda Ole, an immigration certificate. Nine years. I know people in Arad, Jews who can't leave the country because they won't get back in because they've been fighting for years. To... They will make any kind of bureaucratic or legal headache they can for Jewish believers in any way they can. You don't see it much anymore, but you used to see Tiftak Aliyadas and Sword. They would open mail. Huh? The religious parties and the political influence they get, they negotiate a small number of seats in the parliament for a disproportionate amount of influence, giving them control of education, citizenship, up to a point they had to break up the Ministry of Interior into a justice ministry and an interior ministry because they were in control of criminal prosecutions. Except when it came to crooked rabbis that were taking bribes. You, you want a kosher certificate for your restaurant? <laughs> no problem. Under the table. <laughs> the whole thing was a racket. Everybody knew it was a racket. They make a lot of problems for Israeli believers and congregations. They can make a lot of problems. Yad Lahim, a hand to the brothers, is really, they're just bullies. But their older brother, Is Operation Judaism. Some of these guys were jokes. I had no problem with Rabbi Arkush in Britain. He refused to debate me. I had no problem with uh, uh, Rabbi Craig Kossov or Finkelstein in South Africa. They refused to debate me. You can go on YouTube and watch them lie. They will actually lie because they believe it's permissible to lie in order to prevent the Jew from believing in Yeshua. They're like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have permissible lying. Like Islam, you're allowed to lie to the infidel. They don't see it as a lie. They see it as military disinformation in the jihad. Well, the Frums, the religious, do the same thing.
but they have gotten more sophisticated. When Jesus is born, out of Egypt I called my son. We understand Hosea 11.1 1 refers to the Exodus with Moses, but it's a type, a shadow of the Messiah coming out of Egypt when King Herod dies. Okay. So, you look at the book of Proverbs. I'm sorry, I think it's Psalms, Book of Psalms. Second Psalm, verse 12. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. Also in Proverbs 30, what is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. Now we know that's about Yeshua. Oh no, says Rabbi Tuvia Singer. I'd love to debate that guy. Rabbi Tuvia Singer says, well look, we interpret scripture in light of scripture. Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I call my son. God's son is Israel. Not the Messiah. Oh, okay. These Christians are crazy. Well, his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Verse 7 of Psalm 2. I'll surely tell you of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I've begotten thee. This is about Israel. How does taking refuge in Israel ever save your neck? I can show you Dozens, dozens of instances in history where saving, where being a Jew would cost you your neck. <laughs> From the Spanish Inquisition to the Holocaust, but how does taking a refuge in Israel save your neck? Israel lives with its finger on the trigger. Yet, out of Egypt I call my son. They're getting more sophisticated. They've gotten more sophisticated in their argumentation. Operation Judaism. They're not as stupid as they used to be. They're as dishonest as they ever were as dishonest. Now there's a way to hang them if you know how to do it. Hang them with their own rope. Remember, David decapitated Goliath with Goliath's own sword. Wait a minute. Eliezer HaKalir, who wrote the liturgy for the Day of Atonement for Yom Kippur in the Middle Ages, said, I said Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah. Wait a minute, the Targum Yonatan says that the fourth servant song of Isaiah 52 and 53 is about the Messiah. The look upon me you they have pierced, even Rashi, Rashi who said, 
Isaiah 53 is about the Jews. Rashi said, Zechariah 12.10 is about the Messiah. The look upon me who they have pierced. If you know what you're doing, you can take them on. Successfully. With God's help, certainly. But most Israelis don't operate on that level. Remember, yeshivas don't educate. They indoctrinate. It's like Roman Catholic Catechism. They don't educate, they indoctrinate. That's how Rabbi Leopold Cohen got saved with Daniel 9. He realized he was indoctrinated. He was not educated in the Word of God. It wasn't what the Scriptures said. It was about what rabbis said about it. Now you can beat these guys if you know what you're doing. But the average Israeli doesn't know how to do this. One of the things they need to teach the Bet Midrash is Messianic apologetics showing how the Talmud supports the Messianic interpretations of these passages. I don't, think, I don't know the curriculum that well, but I think there should be more emphasis on this. That's my view. They're doing it now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's good. Look at the book of Joshua, chapter 8, please. Verse 35. Joshua 8, 35. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel. There's no Torah Baal Pei. The rabbis claim it was given on Mount Sinai, but not written down. No, everything that God commanded Moses was written down because it was read. But the average Israeli doesn't know that. Eight. what I call pseudo-evangelical anti-Zionism. More popularly known in Israel is Christ at the Checkpoint. You have a reaction against believers who take scripture literally that the restoration of Israel nationally fulfills prophecy. In this country, it's led by Stephen Sizer. In Israel, it's led by Salim Munyaner and Alex Awad, the guy I debated on TV that time. And in the United States, it's led by the pseudo-theologian Gary Burge, the reform guy originally out of Wheaton College. When you confront them with verses, even in the New Testament, that plainly, plainly state Israel would be reborn as a nation and the Jews would return to Jerusalem, they use that kind of argumentation. We shouldn't pay attention to that. We should put our focus on the overall teaching about brotherhood and justice, as if the two were mutually exclusive. There was quite a debate in Israel among pastors several years ago. And both sides had some points. Most of the Israeli pastors who are friends of mine, most of them, maybe all of them, but certainly most of them, said, we should have nothing to do with this. It will be bad for our testimony to Jews in Israel to get involved with this conference. Others 
not many, but some others said, but wait a minute, if they're going to give us an invitation, we can get our foot in the door and we can at least put across the other's view that Israel does fulfill prophecy. So there was a debate among Israeli pastors. Some saying, we, most saying we should not, they should not, some saying they should. I can understand both, or at least both arguments are logical. Both arguments were logical. They, neither one of them was saying stupid things. They were both making valid points. I don't care if this goes out. I'm telling you. Put the, I don't care. I knew more Rosen, founder of Jews for Jesus. I knew him quite well. Morse Rosen paraphrased Martin Luther King in the Jews for Jesus newsletter where he said, anti-Zionism is simply the modern expression of anti-Semitism. That was the official position of Jews for Jesus. The scandals in England and Great Britain with Stephen Sizer were not only in the Jewish Telegraph, they were not only in the Jewish Chronicles, they were in the secular press and all over the web. It became a point of contention with a backlash from the Conference of Christians and Jews. People were not believers, these are liberals, you understand, these are theological liberals. It's in the media. The Church of England, a bishop who was okay with homosexual ordination. Banned Sizer from preaching because of the anti-Semitic nature. He couldn't preach in his own pulpit. They would not let him as a vicar preach in his own church. He was blaming the Jews for September 11th attacks in America, conspiracy theories, all kinds of things. All kinds of things. It's in the media. Tremendously damaging to the church's witness to Jewish people in Great Britain. And the whole check posting was very divisive and problematic in Israel at the time. I'm only stating facts. It did not stop Richard Harvey, Jews for Jesus Council, and Susan Perlman, the matriarch of Jews for Jesus, from going to his pulpit. Not once, but twice. He became their token Jews. I'm not anti-Semitic. Look, Jews for Jesus like me. His money is as good as anybody else's, honorarium. Completely demolished their witness and testimony to the Jewish community of Britain. Jews for Jesus destroyed their testimony. This is in the mainstream media. It's in the Conference of Christians and Jews. It's all over the Jewish press. How can you be a witness to the Jews unless you are a witness? This is Christian anti-Semitism at its worst. Practically. Didn't bother David Brickner. He let it happen. I used to like that guy. I used to like Jews for Jesus. I wouldn't give you a sixpence for that organization. It's lost its integrity. Steven Sizer? Not once, but twice! This whole check post thing did a lot of damage. It did a lot of damage in America, it did a lot of damage in Britain, and it did a lot of damage in Israel. I recall the Israeli pastors arguing over it. Should I go? Should I not? Should he go? Should we speak in it? But at least they were reasonable men. They were there to put across the other side. They weren't there for a photo op with Steven Sizer. You may as well get a photo op with Himmler. Or Eichmann, if you ask me.
as somebody who blames the Jews for September 11th. This was an instrument of Satan. This whole pseudo-evangelical anti-Zionism. Next one. Misallocation and misappropriation. We are told in Corinthians that the gospel preachers, the evangelists, are the ambassadors of Christ. Paul described himself later in Ephesians as an ambassador in chains. It is those who preach Yeshua who are his real ambassadors? His real embassies are the congregations who preach him as Messiah. What right does some organization have to misrepresent itself as an embassy of a Jesus they refuse to preach with tons and tons of money going into it that should be going to help needy believers and to preach the gospel. They don't tell their supporters about their non-evangelistic policies. I watched the film of Van der Hoven. Now, I'm not talking about Christian Friends of Israel or Prayer for Israel. They're not like that. I've got no argument with those guys. I saw Van der Hoven, its founder, with Morris Cirillo, who that Christian embassy brought into Israel. They were the first ones to bring him in. Morris Cirillo went on TV in Britain on the dispatches program, remember? Send 10 pounds and see two Jews saved. And as an added bonus, two members of your family will be born again. Yeah. He, he actually did this on TV on a very popular TV show, a new news documentary show. Send 10 pounds and see two Jews saved, and as an added bonus, two members of your family will be born again. This was Cirillo. Sakharam brings Cirillo with his book, Hashalom, into Israel, which was distributed without the permission of the local congregations. Lisa Lodon and Joseph Shulam, they were all speaking against it at the time. Baruch Maoz were all speaking against it at the time, rightly so. And it, that book's national distribution without the consent of the local body of Christ provoked an anti-mission law, making it criminally prosecutable under certain... Like, you want to give a Jew a Bible, a new you have to put it down, let him pick it up. That's what the lawyers were saying. They'll, they'll, they'll try to set you up. Anyway, this Van der Hoeven speaks at Cirillo's big conference in Europe. This is just what he said. He distorts Isaiah chapter 40 out of all context. And it says, comfort ye my people. It says to comfort the Jews, don't preach. No. No. Keep reading down to verse 9. The way you comfort them is to preach. Bissarah, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. It's the introduction to the first fourth servant song. He completely butchers the text out of context. One of his successors, Malcolm Heading, likewise made heretical statements. I cannot tell you the amount of money that has gone into these organizations like this. And the people who founded CFI, 
People like Colonel Darby, good man, nephew of the famous General Wingate. He said that these people are living an ambassadorial lifestyle. They're living like diplomats. <laughs> And Christians are given money thinking they're supporting the embassies of Jesus in Jerusalem. They're robbing the local congregations, in effect, if you ask me. I see these believers that were coming from Russia. They had nothing. Ethiopia, they had nothing. They needed help. Misappropriation, misallocation. There are many organizations in Israel. who are getting paid for merely being there. They have a purely, at best, social gospel and political agenda. But I know some of them would distance themselves from the local believers because they don't want to offend the rabbinut, the rabbis. I remember when they beat up Anthony Simon that time for giving out New Testaments. The tenth weapon of Satan against the spread of the gospel of Israel. Dual covenant theology. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. Now don't get me wrong. My family was Israeli. I support Israel. I believe in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel very strongly. I'm pro-Zionist. How could I not be? However, my support for Israel does not come at the expense of not presenting the gospel to Israel. My heart's desire New Testament says is that they might be saved. We have people like John Hagee, who's divorced and remarried, by the way. John Hagee says Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. So we can't hold Jews accountable for not believing in, in him. No, read John 4. What did he tell the woman at the well? I'm Santa Claus, I'm Father Christmas, I'm the Easter Bunny. A love for the Jews or anybody else who doesn't preach Christ is not the love of Christ. You have the love of Jesus. If you have the love of Jesus for the Jews, you're going to desire that they be saved. That's the same for any people. But it's certainly true of Israel. Now, with the Neo-Galatians, you have a supposedly Messianic Jewish version of this with the NAR guys that the salvation outside of Christ. Now you got Jews jumping on this. I had met Jews in Israel who believed that because of the Holocaust, Jews are saved. Or at least the ones who perished. Now that may be true of the children and things like this. Remember, the abortion rate in Israel is beyond astronomical. The modern state of Israel has killed more Jewish children than Adolf Hitler.
it is the Muslim Arabs and the ultra-Orthodox who have the big families. Stereotypically. Dual covenant theology. The gospel is the power of salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first. In Romans chapter 2, the consequences of rejecting the gospel are against the Jews first. Because it's available to them first, the ramifications of rejecting it are against them first, according to Romans chapter 2. Dual covenant theology. No, there's no other name of the heaven by which men can be saved. As best I can tell, and I've been looking at these issues for many years, carefully and prayerfully, and I hope scripturally. I'm confident scripturally. These are the ten chief weapons of Satan in attacking the work of the gospel in Israel in the last days. In conclusion, we'll go through them once more. Churchianity, Neo Ebionism, Neo Galatianism, Replacementism, New Age Pseudo Spirituality, the Misrata Panim, Operation Judaism, Pseudo Evangelical Anti Zionism, Misallocation and Misappropriation and dual covenant theology. These are the ten things Satan is trying to fight back with. It's the ten things, the ten weapons in his arsenal with which he is attacking the body of Christ and the cause of the gospel in Israel. We need to be aware of these things. Praise God for what God is doing. But Peter tells us we are foolish indeed if we are not aware of what Satan is trying to do. May God save Israel and the Jewish people. Laila Tov. There is much debate and confusion today concerning the issue of the timing of the rapture, or even the doctrine of the rapture. We have those who are denying there is one. The fundamental truth of scripture long held by born-again Christians is now being discounted or dismissed, or even ignored, and being ignored at the behest of major Christian leaders, such as Rick Warren, who tell people to avoid the subject of end-time prophecy. The return of Jesus, the rapture and resurrection, is our blessed hope, yet we're being exhorted by people claiming to be Christian leaders to ignore our own blessed hope 
even though the Lord Jesus himself commanded that we be watchful for these things. Then we have fragmentation among those who believe in the rapture. Not just between those who are pre-tribulational and mid-tribulational and post-tribulational or pre-wrath or intra -seal, but the pre-tribulational people are divided against themselves now between the traditional pre-tribulation people and later ones who are calling the apostasy of 2 Thessalonians the rapture itself. There's so much confusion and infighting within each specific camp and the camps opposed to each other. Most of the books addressing this issue have been reactionary, one position reacting against another position. In the book Harpezo, which is the Greek word for rapture, that is snatching away, we put all of these things to one side. We take a proactive, expository, exegetical response. What do the scriptures themselves teach about the rapture? What does the word of God say about it? That's our premise. We don't try to refute anything. We don't try to respond to any other position. We simply say, this is what the word of God actually says. Having done that, you will draw your own conclusions as to which position is correct. The book does, of course, conclude that the intra-seal position is the right one, that Jesus comes between the sixth and seventh seal. We do not believe, however, that the restrainer is an angel. And we have some views concerning the way the early church would have understood the two witnesses in Revelation chapters 11, 12, and all the way to chapter 13 concerning the Antichrist and false prophet. The book Carpezo is not like any other book ever written on the subject. It uses typology not as a basis of doctrine, but to illustrate doctrine, looking at all of the other rescue narratives in Scripture as types of the coming rescue, but again, only for purposes of illumination, not for purposes of doctrinal conclusion. We want the conclusion to come from you as the Holy Spirit leads you prayerfully and carefully as you study the subject of the return of Jesus. Again, no book on the rapture has ever been written by anyone, to our knowledge, the way Harpezo has been written. It's comprehensive. It looks at aspects of the rapture most Christians have never even thought of. But more importantly, it's focused on the fact that Christ is indeed returning for his bride. And our aim is that by the grace of God, we who remain will be ready when he comes.